Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to worship this morning, uh, whether you're joining us online or here in the building. Uh, my name is Mary King, if I don't know you yet, and um, I'm one of the local preachers for the Methodist Church in Ireland. I wonder if you'll pause with me for just a few moments um, as we still our hearts and our minds this morning for worship. Creating God, we praise you for your word which called the universe into being, and for your spirit which breathed life into your human creation made in your image. We praise you that in your love you seek to embrace us in our brokenness, and that while your only son was handed over to death, you raised him to life, a new creation by which you recreate each of us as we believe in hope and accept in faith. Source of life, word of life, and breath of life, we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you join us as we sing our opening hymn? It's found in Mission Praise, number 69, Change My Heart, O God. And let's sing it, um, I think sing it twice. Please stand. she'll come forward and read our Old Testament reading for us this morning. The first reading is from Genesis 2 verses 15 to 17 and then chapter 3 verses 1 to 7. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Chapter 3 reads, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, you may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat from the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. 
When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fake leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Here ends the reading. Will you stand together as we sing our next hymn? It is um, found in Hymns and Psalms, number 370, O Perfect Love. There's a few children here today. Would you guys mind coming up to the front? I want to talk to you a second, and I have to take the mic with me. And I have to get my bucket. Now, I was wondering if one of you, um, Millie, is there any chance that you'd stand in that pail for me? No. Okay. Um, is there any chance you'd stand in the pail for me? Would you? That is very brave, and I appreciate it very much. Can you climb in there? Can you step in? Yeah? Let me help you. I'll help you in. What's your name? David. What is it? David. All right, David. Now here's the next challenge. I want to know if you can put your hands on those handles and can you lift yourself up? <laughs> you see these? Right. Can, you can't do it. Try, try once more. You can't do it. Now why? There's a good reason why David can't do that. Why can David, why can he not lift himself up? Yeah. Because he can't lift himself. Because he can't lift himself. You move way ahead. Why, why can he not lift himself, though? Why not, Isabel? 
because he's in the bucket, right? There's this old saying that I've heard, but I don't know if you've heard, and Zadie told me there's no way she had heard it, but you can't lift yourself up by your own bootstraps. Have you heard that? Yeah? So I don't have bootstraps on mine, although I see on Millie's sneakers that you have little straps on the back of them, and those are bootstraps. It means that you can't pick them up and lift yourself up. So instead, someone else will actually have to lift you up outside of the pail. Isabel, do you think we could lift David up? Let's give it a go. Are you brave? Can you hold my hand? Ready? And here we go. There we go. <laughs> you want to step out now? Can you get out? Yeah. Thanks. So this isn't actually true just for people that stand in pails. This is actually true for all of us all the time. We can't carry ourselves by ourselves all the time. And actually God made us that way. We don't all have the strength that we need all the time. And so we need other people to carry us. So it doesn't mean that you're weak when you ask for help from people that are around us. Who are the people around you that you turn to for help? Who are, your, who are the helpers in your life? Anyone? Nobody helps you. Does anyone help you? Yeah? Who, who helps? Your mom? Oh, your sister helps you with your homework. That's good. Do your mom help you? How about your teachers? Do your teachers help you? Yes, some hesitation. No, they, they do, and we have doctors and all sorts of people, neighbors and friends that help us. And we are made to help others and to ask others to help us too. There's a Bible verse up here that's from um, Galatians. So Paul wrote this to us, and he says, carry each other's burdens, it means help each other, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. So, I want you to remember, remember that as we go on. And let's do a, um, I have a prayer for us to say together. So as I say a line, then you repeat it back to me. You, everyone, actually. <laughs> let's bow our heads. Lord Jesus, we, we thank you for one another. We know that you love us. And that you know us each by name. Please bless our time together. Amen. You guys are dismissed to Sunday school. And David, thank you so much. And you guys have a good day. I mean, our New Testament reading this morning is from the book of Matthew. It's chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. And in our Pew Bibles, it is found on page 967. And it says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then the devil took him to the Holy Spirit, to the Holy City, sorry, and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift, up, lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot, foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put your Lord God to the test. And again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. 
All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil left him, and the angels came and attended him. Thus ends the reading. We stand together as we sing our next hymn. It's um, found in Singing the Faith, number 729, but it should be on the screen. Touch the earth lightly. Today is the first Sunday of Lent, the 40 days preceding Easter. And in the church calendar, it's a penitent season, uh, a time for reflection and prayer, and well, a, a kind of retreating of sorts before Easter. Now, our worship services here in Cork usually follow the church lectionary. And so that means the scripture passages each week are set according to the larger church calendar. And they're chosen in such a way that they point us in a certain direction. And they orient us. And during Lent, they're meant to prepare us for Easter, which they do primarily, I think, by asking us to get honest. I listened to a sermon last week where the minister phrased it this way, the Lenten season offers an opportunity to unmask our concerns, and we do not have to pretend. We can be honest about our fears and anticipate a better future at the same time. I think this is the Lenten journey in its best sense. It is bookended by the reality, from dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Just prior to our Genesis reading today that any read, God fashioned Adam out of dust. And a few um, verses after our reading ends, he is told, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return, in verse, chapter 3, verse 19, when both man and woman are banished from the Garden of Eden. And this is the human condition, and it's as honest as we can get. And it's true for every single person who has ever lived. We are born from dust, 
and to dust we shall return. And there's great grief in that. But I wonder if any of you know the Latin root word um, for dirt or earth. Does anyone know? Terra. Terra is earth, but the Latin word for, if you're a gardener, you might see this on compost or topsoil, humus, H-U-M-U-S, humus. It's not dust, it's good soil. It's fertile soil. It's soil where the leaves have, have broken down. The word human has the same root, humus and human, because we are molded from the earth. Humus, human, and humility, all with the same root. And sometimes we interpret humility in, uh, with a kind of negativity to it, that we have to lower ourselves in order to be humble. But that's not really it. We can't be puffed up, that's true. But humility means having a posture with our feet firmly planted in the ground, rooted. Now we may have our heads up in the clouds, but we are rooted in the earth. And when we do that, we have a way of facing the world that doesn't lower ourselves, because the ground we're made from is sacred. But it allows us to look at reality with our eyes open. We are human and fallible. We make mistakes. And our bodies, sacred as they are, will not last forever. It's in that knowledge and awareness that Lent makes a space for us to grieve as a people. We have two different texts today, and both of them, I think, speak to our humanity, to this aspect of ourselves, that we are sacred and valuable and fallible. Last spring, as part of the training to be a local preacher, I uh, and Liz enrolled in a preaching course or module, and there were readings involved and lectures, and every week we met together in small groups. And we were taught about different preaching styles, teaching, meditative, there were a number of them. The goal was to help us become more effective speakers, uh, to communicate effectively and to get the message across. But a number of times I wondered about the listeners. I was thinking of myself as a listener when I sit here, and how sometimes I'm not in a place or a state of mind to listen. But I was also thinking of the fact that not all people hear the same thing when someone speaks. Miscommunication is common. When someone intends to say one thing and the other person hears something slightly different or completely different. This is true especially in family relationships, parents, kids, siblings. And it's the cause of many disagreements and resentments that may be misunderstandings, really. Perhaps the speaker needs to communicate more clearly, as our preaching course was trying to help us to do. But maybe the listener needs to listen more generously or graciously, with grace, assuming that the speaker has good intentions and is there in good faith. Such misunderstandings are unfortunate parts of being in relationships, but they're usually fixable if both people keep good faith and don't insist on being right, which is a big one, actually. But there are more complicated cases where it's difficult to explain exactly how we hear such different things. And I'll just tell you that often, I think it's the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, which is not just confined to the church building, but it advocates for us and intervenes for us and moves among us. And sometimes I think that's why we hear such different things. There's a woman named Kathleen, and that's not her real name, actually, but that's the name that I know her by. And she's no longer living, but for a number of years, 
she was confined to the Good Shepherd Laundry, one of the Magdalene Laundries, and it's on the north side of the city. It's still an imposing kind of a building, even though it's been burned a couple of times now. If you're not from Cork, um, it's over above Sunday's Well, and it's to the east of the Cork Jail. It's the kind of thing that you can see from a distance, you can see the building, but when you get it, it's hard to see it up close. The Magdalene Laundries, if you don't know, were actual laundries, um, where hotels and restaurants and private citizens had their sheets or clothing, etc., laundered. And churches had their, the priest robes and vestments and banners and such laundered there as well. And that's all well and good. But the women that worked there were not paid for their work. And they were often housed against their will. Now the la laundries were called Magdalene laundries, named after Mary Magdalene. Supposedly, they were a place where women who needed it could be rehabilitated, but they didn't function that way, certainly not often, if at all. Now, I hope as Christians that we all know Mary Magdalene as one of Jesus' closest friends and followers. She's mentioned in Matthew, Mark, and Luke um, 12 times, specifically, more than any other person. She was a person who first encountered Jesus after his resurrection, and the woman who found the empty tomb and told everyone else. But her reputation was absolutely ruined by the church for centuries, and she's much more widely known as a fallen woman, after Eve, the most fallen woman, I think. Of her background, um, we only know in Luke chapter 8, he says that Mary Magdalene was healed of demons. But in around the year 600, <clears throat> Pope Gregory I identified her in a sermon as a harlot and a prostitute. Perhaps he was confused because there were so many Marys in the New Testament and he accidentally mixed them up. I don't know. That's extremely sloppy if that's the case. But in any case, it stuck for like 1,500 years. Now, how does that happen? Now, there are a number of different Marys in our gospel. I'm one of the Marys from the congregation, and there's a number of us. And I know folks can get us mixed up, but I think you'd all agree that we're different people. You may get us mixed up, but sure, you know we're not all the same Mary. In the Bible, those Marys are different people too, but truthfully, they've been reduced generally down to two Marys. Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Mary Mag Magdalene, who was lumped together with all the Marys, made into a, a kind of different person, really, and labeled a former prostitute, a fallen woman. And thus, the Magdalene laundries were for fallen women, women who were pregnant out of wedlock, women on the margins of society, often with no one to advocate for them or speak up for them. Kathleen, who resided in the laundry, her mother was a traveler, um, which is a really marginalized group here in Ireland. And she was left at that orphanage by her mother when she was four. And she had a brother as well. Unless you start judging her mother, her mother was at various points confined to the mental asylum. And Kathleen was sometimes moved to the mental asylum too, and they were sometimes there at the same time and didn't know each other. When she got to school age, she was sent to an industrial school, which was like the laundries and orphanages run by the church, where she was not given much of an education, but was forced to work there as well, mostly, and to attend mass daily. When she was 15, she was moved to the laundry directly from the industrial school. She was in no way a fallen woman, nor were many of the women held in the laundries. And I think, if we're honest, we know that that is still true for many women outside of that system who are labeled in one way or another or thought of as fallen. And it often has absolutely nothing at all to do with their behavior. 
Now, I'm telling you this story about Kathleen because, first of all, I want to be able to tell you what she says about her faith when she was asked a few years ago. Um, she died in 2018. It's such a hopeful and a life-giving statement to me, and I want to share it with you. And it is about how we each hear different things. But also, because the way Kathleen wound up in that laundry is tied to the way the laundries themselves were named after Mary Magdalene and her ruined reputation. And that is deeply connected to our Old Testament passage today that Annie read, which is excerpted from Genesis. If you'll remember, it's two verses from chapter two, and then we skip some, and then it's the first seven verses from chapter three. As an excerpt, it leaves out details that might change how we hear it. Really beautiful details, I think, and personal ones. And I want to see if we can recover a few of them today. I don't know what, if, I invite you to look in your pew Bibles and turn to Genesis 2. You don't have to, and I don't know what page it's on, but it's going to be at the beginning of the, of the Bible. But here's the larger context from our excerpt. This is the second account of creation. Of the two accounts we have, this is the second one. The first one being in chapter 1. And just a few verses earlier in chapter 2, I want you to see that God plants the garden. He doesn't speak it into being. He plants it. And then God molds Adam from the dust or the clay, shaping him. Not speaking him into being either. Now I wonder as you think about that, can you picture the color of the clay? And can you feel what it might feel like? And then breathing life into his nostrils in verse 7. In the first creation story, God speaks things into being and into existence, but not here. Look at how personal God is here. How relational this story is and how full of sensory detail it is, relating to our senses. And it is particular. There are four rivers that flow out of the garden. Now, the first two don't exist today, and while some scholars may be able to suggest where they are, no one really knows. But their location is described here with vivid details. Land with aromatic resin and onyx, so smells. With gold that was good. And then the next two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, they can be found on a map today. The garden is given a specific location, a particular spot, a real one. It's not an abstract, perfect place that we can move here and there. No, it's a real spot. It is rooted. After the man and the woman eat the fruit, they hear the sound of God walking in the garden. In the cool of the day, so again, you can, you can hear the sound of rustling grass or leaves, and you are told that it's the cool of the day. And then the Lord God says to the man, where are you? The details in the story are really important. They make it unique, yes, but they give us context as well. And now when we leave out details, especially in a story as old as this one, and one that speaks to where we come from and to our nature, when we leave out details here, the story becomes what's called an archetype. It's a template that you can move from here to there, placing it, placing these people in it, and then these people, and then these people. It's a story, yes, but it's lacking nuance. And frankly, it's dangerous. The characters become not characters anymore, not real, not flesh and blood. They become objects. That's where we get objectified. They're lacking details. And when they lack details, we make them into empty containers, and we put our own thoughts and our own ideas and our own baggage into them. When we objectify people or God, 
because that's what the serpent does to tempt Eve. He objectifies God. When we objectify people, we remove their voice. If you look at the conversation between the serpent and Eve, God is entirely absent from the conversation. Though they speak entirely about God, God does not speak, nor is he invited to speak. Now, I think that many times we may hear preaching on this passage that's done with a lot of conviction, which I'm doing, I, I admit, but not very much care. That's not been my experience here, I want to say, but it has been my experience earlier in life. And I'm aware that people hear things differently. Sometimes they hear different things entirely. And for too many people, they've heard sermons, maybe several, on Genesis chapters 2 and 3 and temptation, or Genesis chapters 2 and 3 and sexuality. And what they've heard, what has seemed pointed and aimed straight at them, and them alone, is that they are less than, broken, irredeemably flawed, and made not quite in the image of God. That their bodies are a mistake. And the truth is that message is already communicated to them out in the world every week in a hundred different ways. The world, as we say here, that they are too much of this or too little of that, or that they're filled with need or desire only. And it can play out an infinite number of ways for people each week. And it's tragic, just unbelievably tragic sometimes, and life-altering. To shame people, is, it can be traumatic. Now the Sunday School folks here are wonderful, and I am so grateful for the time and the care that they put in with our kids. So grateful. Kathleen ran away from the laundry. She had been moved to one in County Waterford. And I initially learned of her from the Magdalene Oral History Archive, in which women who had lived or worked in the laundries, whether it was for a short time or a long, they were invited, if they wished, to give an account of their time there so that after they're gone, that account would stand as a witness to, that this happened. What the days were like, and how they were treated, and what their jobs were. And it was an incredibly difficult life for many of them. They were up early to attend mass, where they set off in a separate area, and they were forced to work long hours, and they were treated really poorly for the most part. It was difficult to form long-lasting friendships because one might be moved to a different location and given a different name, and then you couldn't find each other. And the Magdalene survivors are an aging population, and not every survivor wanted to give an interview. They're individual people too, and they have their own life stories, which includes stuff besides that they were in a laundry. And each of their stories is different, but one of the things that is kind of a commonality across them that they tend to share is that they remained quite religious. Often they were very active in the lives of their parishes and in their neighborhoods. And Kathleen's interviewer asked her about her faith. Well, really the interviewer couldn't understand why she really remained Christian because she had been treated so badly by the church for such a long time. So she says, I mean, how did your faith remain intact? And Kathleen thought about it and said, I don't know really. Somehow, I just knew that the stuff the nuns said about me wasn't true. I just knew it wasn't true. Kathleen heard what she needed to hear what the Holy Spirit helped her to hear, despite what society and the church might have told her. She heard that she was loved by God, and she heard God's grace, and she heard that she was a person, a human, with sacred value and dignity and worth. And that's humility. 
It meant that she was rooted and grounded and a really open person, open to others around her and absolutely open to the Holy Spirit as well. In our gospel passage from Matthew, Jesus is led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. That's the 40 days of Lent. And I just have two things I want to point out about the passage. The first is that unlike Mark, where Jesus is driven into the wilderness, here in Matthew, Jesus is led into the desert by the Holy Spirit. He's led there, but he's not left alone. He's tempted in the desert while he's there, but the Holy Spirit remains with him. And when we face our own wildernesses, temptations, or periods where we feel like we've lost the thread somehow, or have lost the thread somehow, we're not left alone either. And secondly, if you look at the temptations themselves, um, the devil tempts Jesus three times here. He's fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and Jesus resists three times. But the temptations, there's a way of looking at them, and you see that they each appeal to Jesus' divinity. They invite him to be superhuman somehow, to be more than human, to be godlike, but to betray himself somehow. Command these stones to be loaves of bread. And Jesus chooses his humanity. For the second, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down from the pinnacle of the temple. They're way up high. The angels will save you. So fly without wings. And Jesus chose his humanity again. Humus, humility. And then the devil offers him power, the chance to rule over kingdoms that he can see below if he'll just betray himself and fall down and worship him. And Jesus chooses to stay right where he is, and the temptations end. Jesus stays and ministers with humanity and among humanity, helping and healing others, not lording over them. As we enter Lent, let us open ourselves to ourselves, honestly. And let us open our lives to the grace of God and our hearts to the Holy Spirit. And please, Holy Spirit, let us to be like Kathleen, who instead of hearing messages of shame from the world was full of grace, feet on the ground, sure of her humanity, and made in the image of God. Let the people say, Amen. Amen. We enter now into um, a ta uh, intercession prayers. And I didn't put it on the screen, but when I say, Lord, in your mercy, would you please respond, hear our prayer? Gracious God, we pray for your blessing on our congregation and for your presence to be seen clearly in what we do and say each day. We pray that your joy and love will flow freely in and through us. Lord, in your mercy. Creator God, we pray for all countries that continue to be torn apart by conflict or hunger or natural disasters. We pray particularly for the people who have lost loved ones or been forced to leave their homes due to the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria and the ongoing war in Ukraine. Lord, in your mercy. Father God, we pray for our local community. We ask that each of us will make use of the individual talents that you've provided us to enable each church group to flourish and so that we can serve our friends and neighbors who are in need. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And loving God, we ask for your healing touch on all who are ill or suffering in body, mind, or spirit. In a moment of silence, please pray for one person that you know needs God's help today.
Almighty God, please draw close to those mentioned so that they may be aware of your healing presence. And we ask that you provide your peace and comfort for them at this time. Lord, in your mercy. And merciful God, give courage and faith to all those who've been bereaved either recently or at this time of year. We pray that by sharing their concerns and griefs with you that they may find the strength to face the future. Lord, in your mercy. Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we pray together as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our offertory hymn this morning is um, Singing the Faith, number 370, Breathe on Me, Breath of God. the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise God the Son and Holy be seated. I think we have some announcements. Um, Andrea, did you have something? Morning, everybody. 
Um, I have just two things to share with you this morning. Um, the first one of those is that today we think of um, Heidi Hogan. So a few weeks ago we discovered that Heidi was the Helen Kim Scholar, um, Ireland's Helen Kim Scholar for the World Federation of Methodist and Uniting Church Women. And today Heidi is heading off on a big adventure. She is going to Brazil and there she's going to have some training for her first lot of training um, as Helen Kim Scholar. So um, we think of Heidi today as she travels and we hope that she has a really good week um, in Brazil um, as she learns more about her role as Helen Kim, Kim Scholar and uh, she meets other scholars from around the world. Um, and also a date for your diary. Um, on Saturday the 11th of March we're hoping to have a gardening day and that is for two reasons. The first one is that we want to have a bit of a general tidy up but the second one is um, in the Grove they're starting a project with their front gardens and they're hoping to give them a tidy and a clean and make them a bit easier for the residents and the gardeners to look after. So we're looking for some help. And it doesn't matter if you don't have a gardening tool of any kind, we will happily provide you with one. Um, so as many people as possible could come and give us a hand on Saturday the 11th of March, that'd be great. It'll be from 10 in the morning until three in the afternoon and you'll get your lunch in the middle of the day. that will be provided for you. So it would be great to see as many people as possible. Thank you very much. Are there any other announcements? If not, let's say the, um, the grace together. Can you stand? And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forever. Amen. Everyone have a good week.